Good morning or good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to Genome Webinars. I'm Julia Caro, Managing Editor at Genome Web, and I'll be your moderator today. The title of today's webinar is Leveraging Multi-Omic Approaches to Understand Disease Stem Cells in Myeloid Malignancies. This webinar is sponsored by Mission Bio. Our speaker today is Dr. Stephen Chung, Assistant Professor at the University of Texas Southwestern Medical Center. You may type in a question at any time during the webinar, and you can do this through the Q&A panel, which appears on the right side of the webinar presentation. We will ask our speaker your questions after his presentation has concluded. Also, if you look at the bottom tray of your window, you will see a number of widgets that can enhance your webinar experience. So with that, let me turn it over to Stephen. Please go ahead. All right. Um, so thank you uh, very much for the introduction. Um, I'm an assistant professor here at uh, University of Texas Southwestern, and uh, I'm a physician scientist um, uh, specializing in taking care of patients with the myeloid malignancies, and uh, I have a lab here that studies um, stem cells in these diseases. So today I'm going to talk about how we've been leveraging some multi-omics approaches to really better understand disease uh, stem cells in uh, and AML and uh, MDS. So I'm going to presume we have a fairly broad audience. So I'll start with some very simple definitions of stem cells. So adult somatic tissues are sustained by stem cells that really have the dual uh, uh, characteristics of being able to self-renew to give rise to other stem cells, as well as to differentiate to give rise to all the more mature cells that make up the bulk of each tissue. Now, because these stem cells need to sustain these tissues throughout the life of an organism, they've really evolved to uh, adopt a number of characteristics to really protect their clonal integrity. Uh, these characteristics um, may vary from tissue to tissue, but um, uh, are that stem cells tend to be rare. Uh, they tend to be quiescent, so they don't replicate their DNA frequently to minimize the risk for introducing errors. And they tend to be resistant to all sorts of external stressors, um, whether by shielding themselves based on their physical location or by expression of multi-drug resistance pumps, among many other mechanisms. Uh, stem cells may undergo symmetric divisions to expand their numbers to uh, replenish tissues during uh, times of injury. Um, they may also undergo asymmetric divisions where they uh, give rise to one stem cell and one non-stem cell that then differentiates into more mature cells that make up the bulk of the tissue. And uh, this is through intermediate progenitor cells where we think the bulk of replication happens and we call these cells transient amplifying cells in the hematopoietic system. We think this occurs largely in um, oligopotent progenitor cells and importantly in these cells that rapidly divide and may introduce many mistakes into their genomes, uh, they are not self-renewing and so won't be propagated. So the cancer stem cell hypothesis posits that cancers are made out of uh, heterogeneous mixtures of cells containing both cancer stem cells and non-cancer stem cells. And those cancer stem cells, similar to normal stem cells, can self-renew and give rise to more cancer stem cells, as well as uh, and they may have the capability to differentiate to give rise to the non-self-renewing bulk of tumors. Now, many properties have been attributed to cancer stem cells by analogizing them to normal stem cells, and much of this remains controversial. Uh, but uh, among these properties are the fact that cancer stem cells are thought to be relatively rare. Um, they're thought to contribute to therapeutic resistance. Um, they're thought to be quiescent. And again, it was initially uh, supposed that uh, cancer stem cells, because they can self-renew, must arise from normal stem cells. Um, we now understand that in certain contexts, cancer stem cells may arise from progenitor cells that do not usually self-renew, but gain aberrant self-renewal. And I'll talk about how we think about this in the hematopoietic system. So the hematopoietic system, uh, within the hematopoietic system, the only self-renewing cell is at the apex of the hierarchy, uh, which is the hematopoietic stem cell. And within the hematopoietic stem cell, or within the hematopoietic system, um, in this context, we study the myelodysplastic syndromes. So these syndromes are characterized by bone marrow failure and peripheral blood cytopenias, as well as an increased risk for progression to acute myeloid leukemia. 
Standard therapies include treatment with DNA methyl transferase inhibitors as well as lenalidomide. And while these therapies can be effective, they um, only work for a limited duration of time and are never curative. The only way to cure these patients is to um, for them to undergo a bone marrow transplant. And this is in part because work by many groups really over the past couple of decades has helped to establish the hematopoietic stem cell as a cell of origin for MDS. So to cure these patients, you really need to replace these stem cells. So these, um, uh, these data are based on prior studies um, showing that nearly all driver genetic lesions um, in MDS can be found in purified hematopoietic stem cells. These stem cells can recapitulate bulk disease in xenografts, and these stem cells also appear to be resistant to standard therapies and serve as the functional unit of therapeutic resistance to these standard therapies. So in prior work from uh, Chris Park and Irv Weissman, uh, it was demonstrated that purified hematopoietic stem cells were capable of engrafting um, in immunodeficient mice human hematopoietic cells um, that retained a disease-associated cytogenetic, such as monosomy 7, as shown here. And these grafts also exhibited features reminiscent of human MDS, such as a decreased granulocyte macrophage progenitor uh, frequency, as well as myeloid-biased functional output. If you look at purified hematopoietic stem cells from MDS patients and you look for disease-associated genetic lesions, such as cytogenetic abnormalities, as shown on the lower left and upper right, we find that hematopoietic stem cells have a very high level of involvement in the upper 80s uh, to 90 percent. Um, and in some cases, nearly every hematopoietic stem cell uh, appears to have the disease-associated cytogenetic abnormality. Similar findings have been found for uh, nearly every driver mutation in MDS. And next-generation sequencing studies looking at large um, cohorts of patients have found that many of these driver mutations may co-occur at varying uh, variant allele frequencies, suggesting that MDS stem cells may be present in a clonal hierarchy. Recent work from Uli Steidel's group has really helped to start to define uh, the presence at the single cell level of um, clonal heterogeneity within MDS stem cells. So what does this mean therapeutically? Um, well, in this study from uh, Sten Jacobson's group at um, where they studied uh, patients with a subtype of MDS associated with deletion 5Q. They showed that patients who achieved a clinical complete cytogenetic remission on lenalidomide, so if you uh, looked at their whole unfractionated bone marrow for DEL5Q, it's it was completely wiped out. Um, and they looked in these patients at um, purified progenitor cells, as shown on the lower right, shown that in this clinical complete cytogenetic remission, DEL5Q is completely absent from progenitor cells. But at the same time, as, as you can see to the left of that lower right panel, if they looked at purified hematopoietic stem cells, DEL5Q was present in nearly half of the cells, even in this clinical complete cytogenetic remission. And this persisted through a remission with re-expansion of these aberrant HSCs prior to Frank disease relapse. In work from uh, Uli Steidel and Amit Verma's groups, uh, they demonstrated that uh, a similar pattern of response and resistance uh, uh, also occurred in response to the more commonly used um, DNA methyltransferase inhibitors, such as azacitidine. And as shown in this patient, um, when uh, this patient was treated with azacitidine, despite a decrease in monosomy 7 uh, from 48% down to 2 to 4%, in this uh, while the patient was in a remission. Uh, if you looked at purified hematopoietic stem cells, monosomy 7 persisted at a very high level, 97 and 90%. Um, thus, in MDS, the hematopoietic stem cell really appears to represent the functional unit of therapeutic resistance. And in this and the other features that I had previously described, MDS really fulfills many of the central tenets of the cancer stem cell hypothesis, despite its um, uh, Controverse, uh, controversiality. Now, we think it's important to study purified MDS stem cells to understand their biology. For example, um, in this uh, study, what's shown here is a study in which um, 
uh, gene expression was examined in purified MDS stem cells and compared with stem cells from age-matched normal controls. And as shown on the upper right, when looking at purified stem cells, if we look at ribosomal protein expression, nearly all of the ribosomal proteins are decreased in MDS patients. And this is consistent with the known role that ribosomal insufficiency is known to play in the pathogenesis of MDS based on what we know from human genetic subtypes as well as genetic models of um, MDS experimentally. Uh, conversely, if you look at CD34 positive cells, which are a complex mixture of stem and progenitor cells, but really mostly non-stem cells, you actually see a, almost the opposite effect. And you certainly don't see this decrease in ribosomal protein expression that we would expect. So we have looked at uh, these data sets to identify cell surface protein transcripts that were dysregulated to identify cell surface markers that may identify MDS stem cells uh, due to the ease with, with which we can further inter interrogate these at the protein level by flow cytometry as well as the potential for therapeutic targeting. And what we've gone on to show and publish is that in MDS, one of the most frequently upregulated cell surface markers is this protein called CD99, and it's upregulated in about 85% of MDS cases on the stem cells. And it's also highly expressed on leukemia stem cells in about 86% of AML. And we've gone on to develop um, uh, and identify and de develop anti-CD99 monoclonal antibodies that have the capability to selectively deplete disease stem cells, such as the CD34 positive 38 negative MDS stem cell enriched compartment. And this has also allowed us to better understand disease biology. Um, and uh, one of the important functions we think that this protein plays is that it negatively regulates the SARC family kinases and these antibodies by disrupting this function lead to hyperactivation of these kinases, leading to downstream signaling that promotes cell death. So acute myeloid leukemia is characterized by an accumulation in the bone marrow of immature blast cells. And standard therapies may include chemotherapy, as well as the DNA methyltransferase inhibitors, as well as targeted therapies um, for certain genetic subtypes of AML. Now, in contrast to MDS, we think that fully transformed AML is likely to be initiated in a non-HSC progenitor that does not usually self-renew but gains aberrant self-renewal. And um, using uh, disease reconstitution potential as a surrogate for leukemia stem cell function, uh, human leukemia stem cells appear to be most enriched in cell populations that have an immunophenotype most similar to lymphoid-primed multipotent progenitors or multi-lymphoid progenitors or granulocyte macrophage progenitors, as highlighted on the right. Nearly all driver genetic lesions in AML can be found in these um, LMPP and GMP subpopulations. And although it's been shown that leukemia stem cells, um, when defined functionally, uh, appear to be uh, enriched at the time of disease relapse in patients, whether they really serve as a discrete functional unit of therapeutic resistance is much more controversial, as there may be much more plasticity to the uh, immunophenotype of the leukemia stem cell. Now, over the past decade or so, we've come to learn that the earliest mutations that arise in AML may, or, it may in fact arise in a functionally normal hematopoietic stem cell, we've termed a pre-leukemic stem cell. And many of the mutations that arise in these functionally normal stem cells um, have been described in a number of experimental systems to confer a competitive self-renewal advantage to these stem cells. And they're oftentimes in things that uh, modify DNA methylation uh, or chromatin, as shown here. So putting this all together, um, how we uh, really think about the onset of these myeloid malignancies from the very beginning is that uh, with age, it's known that hematopoietic stem cells will randomly accu accumulate mutations um, linearly. Um, it's estimated that every decade or so, each hematopoietic stem cell is likely to accumulate at least one exonic mutation. We have about 50 to a couple hundred thousand hematopoietic stem cells. So if you do all of the, the math, by the time we're 60 to 70, one would expect that we would have about half a million to a million and a half mutations in our stem cells in the coding regions of, of genes in our stem cells. And so most of these mutations um, have absolutely no effect on the fitness of a stem cell, 
But if they happen to arise in a gene in the right place, such that it confers a competitive self-renewal advantage, that stem cell can clonally expand. And in fact, if we can detect the mutation by bulk next generation sequencing, that has this generally has to be a, a fairly massive clonal expansion. And in extreme cases where these mutations actually affect hematopoiesis, we call it the myelodysplastic syndrome. But as we've come to learn, in many cases, these mutations may not affect the um, hematopoietic uh, potential of these stem cells. And we call it, um, if patients go on to develop leukemia, pre-leukemic hematopoiesis. And we think leukemia occurs when you acquire additional mutations, which lead to aberrant self-renewal of progenitors, uh, leading to the formation of leukemia stem cells that sustain acute myeloid leukemia. Now, what happens if you have this pre-leukemic hematopoiesis, but you never progress to leukemia? How often does this happen, and what are the consequences? Well, this is really at the heart of um, a recently described entity uh, termed clonal hematopoiesis. So clonal hematopoiesis is the observation that in about 10 to 25% of older adults, you can find clonally expanded hematopoietic stem cells. Uh, the frequency of this really depends on the uh, depth of sequencing and the technology used, the breadth of genes that you look at. Um, but overall, um, if you have uh, clonal hematopoiesis at a variant allele frequen frequency of uh, greater than 2%, um, you have an increased risk for developing a myeloid or, or any hematologic malignancy of about um, tenfold. Um, but these malignancies are rare, so most people actually never develop a hematologic malignancy because um, the absolute risk remains low. So about 95% of these people will never develop a hematologic malignancy. However, um, they appear to have a large increase in risk for all-cause mortality of about 40%, and this has been mostly attributable to vascular disease. And MESS models have helped to show that this is in part attributable to increased elaboration of inflammatory cytokines such as IL-1 beta and IL-6 uh, by the clonal progeny of these stem cells such as monocytes. And this has uh, continued to bear out in the human genetic data um, as it's been recently shown that um, people with a genetic IL-6 receptor deficiency may have an attenuated cardiovascular disease risk. Now, MESS models, as outlined on the, the left um, by a number of groups, have helped to uh, recapitulate some of the phenotypes of clonal hematopoiesis, such as increased atherosclerosis, really strongly suggesting that there is a direct causative role uh, for clonal hematopoiesis in uh, promoting these phenotypes. However, there are many limitations to these MESS models, not the least of which is that wild-type mice do not develop clonal hematopoiesis, and not all human uh, clonal hematopoiesis-associated mutations necessarily expand HSCs in mice as they appear to do in humans. And this is at least in part due to the fact that mouse models are unlikely to recapitulate the diversity of age and microenvironment that influence CHIP and are like to, likely to vary uh, greatly in patients. So studies of human clonal hematopoietic stem cells um, are largely lacking except for the studies simply describing the presence of the mutations. And one of the reasons for this is that the frequency of clonal HSCs in humans uh, on average is low. The median variant allele frequency is only 8%, really limiting the impact of studies of bulk cell populations. Now, we and others have described cell surface markers that can separate leukemia stem cells from pre-leukemic or normal stem cells. But I would argue that this is kind of like comparing apples and oranges, as most leukemia stem cells really 99% uh, look like progenitors. And so when comparing them with hematopoietic stem cells, you're really comparing very different cell types. And that's why I would argue it's been relatively easy for those in our field to find markers that can distinguish the two. Conversely, finding cell surface markers to separate functionally and genotypically distinct hematopoietic stem cells are largely lacking, but based on our work, finding CD99 as a cell surface marker upregulated at MDS stem cells, uh, we are convinced there are markers that will be uh, capable of allowing us to separate out these uh, distinct HSC populations. So um, the focus of my lab is really to understand um, uh, two major questions. And one is that uh, 
is how clonal HSCs outcompete their unmutated counterparts, as well as how leukemia stem cells gain aberrant self-renewal. And what I'll really focus on for the rest of this talk is some of the work we're doing to, to uh, identify uh, tools to study clonal HSCs in patients using both single cell sequencing and multiomics approaches to identify clonal HSC-specific cell surface markers. So um, in uh, work I performed as a postdoc, we performed uh, single cell RNA sequencing of purified hematopoietic stem cells, uh, purified from MDS patients, where as I showed before, the vast majority of HSCs are clonal. And we compared them with age-matched elderly controls, which based on what I previously showed, might be expected to contain a small, uh, low frequency of clonal hematopoietic stem cells. And what we found was um, that when we sequenced over about 700 plus uh, cell, single cells, uh, that um, in normal stem cells, as shown in pink, there is a very uh, small cluster of normal stem cells in nearly all of our controls that really clustered with MDS uh, stem cells. So when we looked at the genes that defined this cluster, uh, we found enrichment for genes uh, transcripts associated with aging phenotypes and mitochondrial, stra mitochondrial function, and mitochondrial stress is a hallmark of aging. And when we look at downregulated genes, we find depletion of many ribosomal protein transcripts, and this is really a hallmark of MDS hematopoietic stem cells. So we think this population really represents a point of convergence between normal aging and MDS and is likely to represent clonal hematopoiesis. And we furthermore identified a list of dysregulated cell surface protein transcripts suggesting that there may be surface markers that will allow us to prospectively separate this population for further studies. However, the sensitivity of single-cell RNA-seq data to detect somatic mutations remains limited. There have been recent advances um, from Dan Landau's group, uh, Tim Lay, uh, Adam Mead, and others looking at uh, somatic mutations in single-cell RNA-seq data, uh, but the efficiency with which we can detect these mutations in rare cell populations, as well as the breadth of mutations to which those techniques can be applied remains limited. And furthermore, the cell surface transcript expression uh, may not necessarily translate to cell surface protein expression. So to address some of these limitations, we turn to a single cell DNA sequencing technology on um, the Mission Bio Tapestry platform. And so this is a droplet-based single cell DNA uh, targeted uh, DNA sequencing uh, technology. And a key feature is uh, during cell lysis and, and encapsulation, there's incorporation of a protease, uh, which helps to release DNA from histones and other DNA binding proteins to allow for more efficient amplification of genomic DNA in what is essentially a large multiplex PCR. And so this allows us to uh, do things uh, to look at a panel of genes like what's listed on the right, um, which is the uh, Mission Bio Tapestry myeloid panel, where we can perform targeted sequencing of 45 genes recurrently mutated in the myeloid malignancies in a very high throughput manner in up to 10,000 cells at a time. So I'd like to go through a couple examples of uh, patient specimens that we've looked at, really just in the process of familiarizing ourselves with this platform. And just in the course of testing this platform, we've uh, made some interesting observations of um, perhaps some clinical relevance. So um, one of the first samples we looked at was from a 56-year-old woman with acute myeloid leukemia diagnosed in 2009. She was treated with standard chemotherapy into a, a remission and relapsed several years later. Later. And the sample was taken in 2019. And so for someone to survive with relapsed AML for seven years is actually a little bit unusual. But she received a number of iterative therapies, including uh, hypomethylating agent Bedeza, multikinase inhibitor serafinib, uh, the MEK inhibitor uh, trametinib, and a FLT3 inhibitor gilteritinib. And after many years of these various selective pressures, she had um, uh, accumulated many mutations as shown on the lower left. So this is bulk genotyping from uh, the Foundation One Heme panel. And what you can see is that she's acquired many signaling mutations in RAS, PTPN11, KIT, and many of these mutations are at a very low variant allele frequency. And so I think for many years, um, uh, Clinicians would look at data like this and presume that 
all these RAS mutations due to the uh, parsimonious ontogeny of the onset of these mutations that we presumed that uh, that they would all be in separate clones. Uh, but based on bulk sequencing, it would be really hard to, to prove this. And so we took this sample and we purified um, blasts that are low CD45 and low side scatter. Um, uh, and the sample also had some maturation into monocytes characterized by higher 45 expression and higher side scatter, but we essentially purified just the leukemia uh, blasts and monoblasts from this uh, sample. And uh, so we ended up getting sequencing data on 6,500 cells. And uh, at first pass, we get uh, kind of a matrix of um, all of these different RAS and PTPN11 mutations, among a couple other mutations. Uh, but uh, putting it all together, this um, really allows us to resolve this complex mixture of uh, cells into a um, coherent clonal hierarchy. So as one might expect in this patient with five RAS mutations, uh, almost all of them are in separate clones, again, as we would expect, with the exception of what we see on the lower right, where we actually have one clone that's only 2.4% of all of the cells that actually has two RAS mutations, and this we, we wouldn't expect. And so, again, this technology is really uh, starting to reveal a lot of unexpected patterns of parallel and convergent evolution where these leukemias really sample the same types of mutations over and over. And so better understanding what the selective pressures are that lead to this, I, I think will be a really important area of future investigation. Um, as it happens, as I mentioned, this patient was on a MEK inhibitor. And we do know that patients on MEK inhibitors may release some of this feedback inhibition of ERK on upstream RAS signaling through the receptor tyrosine kinases. And so one might expect in a patient on trametinib for a long time that you might have hyperactive upstream RAS signaling, which um, can crosstalk with other pathways and lead to downstream signaling, such as PI3 kinase, AKT, et cetera. So our hypothesis, and this is simply speculative, um, is that MEK inhibition may have selected for clones that are really dependent on hyperactive RAS. And so this leukemia had a reason to keep on sampling these different RAS mutations. Another sample we looked at was from an 82-year-old uh, gentleman with uh, JAK2 mutated MDS uh, slash myeloproliferative neoplasm with progression to AML. He was treated at the time of um, uh, obtaining a sample with azacitidine, uh, the JAK2 inhibitor, ruxolitinib, and hydroxyurea. And as shown on the lower left, we sorted uh, blasts, low CD45, low side scatter. And this includes immature cells, um, which may also um, capture some uh, normal uh, stem and progenitor cells. And so in this patient, the clonal hierarchy was much more simple. The dominant clone, which was 94% of cells, had a JAK2 and TET2 mutation. And there were two, so, uh, two small subclones that acquired two different WT1 mutations. So again, here we have this parallel and convergent kind of evolution. And importantly, both of these clones are very small, so 2.6%, 0.3%. So these were completely missed on bulk next generation sequencing. Um, again, as I mentioned, uh, these blasts may include some normal stem and progenitor cells. And so we see this um, as 3% uh, uh, of the population being wild type. So we took this um, sample and we uh, created a patient-derived xenograft. So we transplanted the cells into an immunodeficient mouse, waited about four months. And on the back end, um, we uh, uh, saw about 91% of this mouse's bone marrow is shown in the middle panel. Uh, were human cells, um, and we purified out the human cells that grew out in this mouse and uh, put it through the same single cell sequencing pipeline. And uh, what we found is shown here, which is that if you compare the blast cells from the patient that we put into the mouse to the human cells that uh, are purified from the xenograft, um, the wild type clone in blue really gets completely outcompeted by by the leukemia cells. That's not surprising. The leukemia graphs much more aggressively. But what's further interesting is that these two very small subclones that were 2.6 and 0.3% really grow out to um, in aggregate predominate in, um, in the bone marrow of this xenograft. And so WT1 mutations um, historically have been associated with poor outcomes. And so we think this really reflects an aggressive disease clone um, that uh, was able to outcompete the other clones in the setting of a xenograft. And so the question that comes up is whether this was a clone that eventually 
uh, grew out in the patient, but unfortunately, between these two time points, the patient had passed away. Um, but uh, one would expect that with further time, one might expect this clone to uh, be uh, what grows out in the patient um, to cause disease progression. And so while there have been many efforts to create uh, patient-derived xenografts that reflect the clonal heterogeneity of uh, that we see in patients accurately, I might argue that a uh, finding like this may be more important, uh, which is that we may not just want to recreate the clonal hierarchy we see in patients, but perhaps if through the filter of a xenograft, we can uh, accelerate and grow what may be the most aggressive and clinically relevant clones to treat in the future, that may um, be more important. So coming back to the question that I uh, framed um, earlier, which is uh, whether we can identify cell surface markers that can separate out clonally or functionally distinct um, human hematopoietic stem cells, um, we sought to use the emission biotapestry along with some uh, newer technology integrated with this platform uh, to assess both genotype and cell surface protein expression in single cells. So to um, measure simultaneous, uh, to perform simultaneous cell surface phenotyping and genotyping in single cells, prior to um, putting cells into um, the droplet-based um, uh, uh, mission biotapestry platform, we stained them with antibodies against candidate cell surface markers. But these antibodies, instead of being tagged uh, with fluorochromes as we would for flow cytometry, were conjugated to oligonucleotide barcodes. And so after single cell sequencing, we can read out not only the genotype of each single cell, but the cell surface phenotype at the protein level. So to test this technology, we first um, took a bone marrow sample from an 86-year-old woman with MDS with no increase in blasts and who was documented based on bulk sequencing to have the three mutations listed on the lower left. Uh, we did a partial CD34 enrichment, but did leave in uh, quite a few uh, more mature cells, as shown on the lower right. Um, uh, this sample was um, composed of about 7.6% CD34 positive cells. So this is what the data look like. We sequenced a total of 5,800 cells um, using this unique DNA plus uh, protein uh, single cell assessment. And what is shown here, just walking you through this um, figure, is on the top is the number of cells. The second row is the genotype of each um, cell population code, uh, coded by heterozygous, homozygous, or wild type. And layered on the bottom is a heat map showing the cell surface expression at the protein level of a core set of markers such as CD34, 38, 90, and 45RA that allow us to look at stem and progenitor cells, as well as a number of candidate clonal HSC specific uh, cell surface markers that I've listed. And so it's still early days with this project, so bear with me, but I've just listed it as kind of marker A through F. And so what you can see initially is that you can see the clonal uh, heterogeneity uh, within the bone marrow. So you have some populations, as, uh, as you can see in the middle, that only have an EZH2 mutation. But then this EZH2 mutated clone appears to uh, have acquired either the U2AF1 mutation or the TET2 mutation. And then there's one clone all the way on the left that has all three mutations. Uh, so again, this is showing us, and many who have been using this technology have been observing the same thing, which is that um, the uh, clonal progression in an orderly linear manner that we had presumed uh, uh, was how myeloid malignancies progressed may not actually be true. But again, many of these mutations may, may be acquired um, in a convergent and parallel manner. Now, if we look at the cell surface protein expression, um, and we focus on the one population, second from the left, that's um, triple wild type. What are these wild type cells? So you can see that they have quite high CD99 expression. And this is curious, as I had previously described CD99 as a cell surface marker highly expressed on MDS, HSCs, leukemia stem cells, and so what gives here, right? So um, as it turns out, CD99, we do know, is also expressed on some mature um, cell populations in the blood, um, in particular T cells and monocytes. And so we think, uh, so this triple wild type population, which is the second most frequent population, is a complex mixture of cells, but 
in large part, it is composed largely of T cells and monocytes, and uh, T, uh, certain subsets of T cells we know also express CD45 RA, as you can see here. Notably, when you look all the way at the bottom at CD34 expression, it um, uh, appears to be negative on these cells, and so they really look like they're mature cells that happen to express CD99 and are wild type. But to be honest, looking at the rest of this heat map, it was really hard for us to really make any other um, coherent kind of conclusions from this. Uh, but as you may recall, we're really interested in looking at differential cell surface expression on stem cells rather than just the entire bone marrow. And so to do this, we realized as we can look at the cell surface protein expression in our single cell sequencing data, we can actually gate on the data like we would flow cytometry data. So we took the subpopulation of cells that were CD34 positive, which as you can see here, uh, contain CD99 high and low cells, just like we see in our CD34 negative population. And so if you furthermore and of gate on CD34 positive 38 negative cells, which are highly enriched for hematopoietic stem cells in humans, you can uh, generate data like this. Um, so just looking at this subpopulation, we now see a much more clear pattern in our cell surface marker expression. So we can see the number of cells as shown on the top, the genotype of these cells in the second row, and then again overlaid on this on the bottom, the cell surface expression of our candidate markers. And what you can see on the right here is that, remember, this is an MDS sample, so greater than 90%, if not more, of the stem cells are expected to be clonal. But we can actually detect a very small number of residual wild-type hematopoietic stem cells. Out of the 5,800 cells we sequenced, this is, in fact, only eight cells. But we can detect it based on the single cell sequencing, as well as these cell surface markers. And what you can see is that uh, the clonal MDS stem cells, as compared with the wild-type stem cells, have massive differences in expression of not only CD99, which we would expect, and we've um, uh, published on, um, but a number of our other candidate cell surface markers. So um, to validate the ability of these markers to really separate functionally and genotypically distinct hematopoietic stem cell populations, we turned to an orthogonal clonal assay. And uh, this is really kind of the classical, somewhat tedious uh, manner in which prior to uh, the technology that I just showed being available would be the only way for us to really uh, try and answer this, uh, these questions, um, uh, but it's still important to do for validation. So in these assays, we purify stem cells from the bone marrows of these patients, and we grow them in methyl cellulose to form colonies. And so this is still a clonal and, if you will, a single cell assay um, and in principle. And uh, But as you expand these colonies, you can genotype them for the mutations you're looking for. So if you gate on hematopoietic stem cells by flow cytometry, uh, they exhibit heterogeneity and expression of two of these markers, CD99 and what we'll just call marker A. And if you take the cells that are double negative for these markers, they form normal looking colonies um, uh, fairly efficiently. But if you genotype the colonies, they completely lack the two mutations present in this particular MDS uh, patient. So these are in fact completely genotypically normal hematopoietic stem cells. Now, if you turn on one marker, you still get colonies. They look normal. But if anything, you get more colonies. But now all of the colonies have uh, the DNMT3A mutation and a subset have a TET2 mutation. So this, in fact, represents, we think, clonal hematopoiesis uh, HSCs. Now, if you turn on both markers, now all of the colonies have both mutations, but you have a much lower efficiency of colony formation. And when you do get colonies, they are very small. So in fact, we think these, uh, in this case, the mutations actually affect the function of the stem cells. And we think these are MDS HSCs, which we and others have shown form colonies very inefficiently in these assays. And so while we think this is important to validate um, the cell surface markers we identify in our more high throughput single cell sequencing studies, um, I think these studies also illustrate the limitations of this classical technique to, uh, to identify these cell surface markers. One is that you can really only look at a couple markers at a time. You very quickly run out of single cells to form colonies in these assays. And when the mutations uh, that you're looking for these markers to identify actually affect the function of these stem cells and their ability to form colonies, you may not be able to genotype them at all. So this um, marker A, which um, is uh, an ion channel um, that's uh, interesting, um, 
uh, we've found that its expression identifies stem cells uh, that have enhanced uh, features of enhanced self-renewal in uh, both the context of human and mouse stem cells. So shown on the lower, lower left, if you take human hematopoietic stem cells, um, they may be positive or negative for this marker. And the marker negative cells, which are the bulk of hematopoietic stem cells, if you grow them in liquid culture with cytokines, they differentiate as um, uh, what we would expect. Um, it's really hard to sustain hematopoietic stem cells in liquid culture. But if you take these marker positive cells in the same uh, context, they really retain this HSC like phenotype, suggesting that they may have enhanced self-renewal. Now, as it happens in most HSCs, expression of this marker is quite heterogeneous and varies over about a log and a half. And if you take uh, stem cells which have high and low expression of this marker, uh, the marker high stem cells have enhanced self-renewal in transplantation assays, again, suggesting that this may be a general mechanism by which clonal hematopoietic stem cells enhance their self-renewal by upregulating this marker. And we hope to uh, have an interesting, um, a more interesting data to come from this in the future. So to summarize, um, we've shown that uh, using single cell RNA and DNA sequencing, uh, that human HSCs are quite heterogeneous. We have identified cell surface markers that can identify these both genotypically and functionally distant stem cells. And so we think this may have uh, many applications. A uh, very practical application may be that if we can detect clonal HSCs, we may not uh, need to. Or, uh, uh, it may provide a more expeditious uh, and cost-effective method to diagnose uh, diseases characterized by these clonal HSCs, such as clonal hematopoiesis or the myelodysplastic syndrome. And this could be done even in routine blood studies as there are circulating HSCs um, at a low level, um, just in peripheral blood. Um, but uh, perhaps uh, most importantly, we think these markers will allow us to perform studies in which we separate clonal stem cells from their non-clonal counterparts, subject them to a number of functional and molecular assays, and we can really um, make comparisons between clonal and non-clonal HSCs um, uh, in a pairwise manner within patients. And in this manner, we can really control for uh, the very uh, variation in age and microenvironment that we expect to see from patient to patient, and which is really likely to, uh, to affect the phenotype of these clonal stem cells. Uh, so just um, to finish up, and this is really kind of a taste of what's to come or a preview of some ongoing work we're doing. Um, uh, based on what I showed so far, we've really focused on the apex of the hematopoietic hierarchy and really a uh, focused question um, about whether we can identify heterogeneity um, within hematopoietic stem cells. But what if we look at more mature cells? Um, can we uh, get a better sense for how these mutations affect the lineage output of these mutated stem cells? And so to really get at this question, we've now started to work with a much larger panel of uh, cell surface antibodies um, using the same technology and um, have combined uh, this mission biotapestry myeloid plant panel, which I showed before, um, with a BioLegend total CKD heme oncology cocktail, which includes 45 antibodies conjugated to these oligonucleotide barcodes, which will mark many different uh, mature cell lineages, in addition to including the cell surface markers we routinely use to identify stem and progenitor cells. Um, so to test this panel out, um, we, uh, we used it on a uh, bone marrow specimens from a recently diagnosed AML patient. Uh, this was a 63-year-old male. He actually had COVID back in March and was subsequently uh, found to uh, have AML after presenting with pancytopenia. We don't think the two are related. Um, uh, he had a bone marrow studies at that time that revealed both by morphology and flow about 28% blasts. So this will be important in a couple of slides. So just remember that about 28% blasts by morphology and conventional flow cytometry. Um, cytogenetics revealed deletion 9Q and molecular genetic testing revealed six mutations as listed here at um, uh, kind of with uh, uh, heterogeneity in terms of the variant allele frequency. And, um, and so ultimately, this patient had a diagnosis of acute myeloid leukemia associated with mutated NPM1.
And so from this patient, we had bone marrow specimens from uh, the time of diagnosis and at day 30 um, upon count recovery after receiving chemotherapy. So basically uh, diagnosis and remission bone marrow. And so we applied to uh, both of these specimens, uh, the Mission Bio Tapestry Myeloid Panel, as well as the Biolegend Total CPD uh, Cell Surface Marker Panel. And um, so just to keep things simple, and this analysis is ongoing, um, most of this data is really fresh from the past 48 hours or so. Um, but if we just look at two of the uh, key mutations in this patient, uh, this NPM1 mutation and this FLT3 uh, tyrosine kinase domain mutation, this is actually a unique uh, uh, tyrosine kinase domain mutation that confers resistance to midostaurin, uh, we find that NPM1 is present uh, alone in a dominant clone that is about 50% of the cells at diagnosis, and an, adi and an additional 16% of cells have both NPM1 and this FLT3 mutation. So, so about 66% uh, of the cells in aggregate have this NPM1 mutation, and uh, remembering that only about 20% of 28% of the marrow was involved with blasts. Um, at diagnosis, 33% of the cells were wild type. And after this patient was treated with chemotherapy, achieved a remission, and recovered his counts, essentially all of the detectable NPM1 or FLT3 mutant cells went away. And so um, uh, NPM1. Uh, minimal residual disease testing by qPCR has turned uh, into a, quite a powerful uh, uh, prognostic indicator in the therapy of these patients. And while we don't think this is likely to be quite as sensitive as qPCR-based techniques, um, this uh, single cell sequencing of a large number of cells may allow us to detect minimal residual disease down to a fairly low level. We would estimate about 0.02%, which would compare favorably with flow cytometry. Now, if we look at the cell surface marker expression, this is where things even just on a first pass have started to get uh, quite interesting. Um, so uh, what is shown here on the right is um, single cell DNA and protein analysis of unfractionated bone marrow uh, just from the time of diagnosis. And what's shown all the way on the right is the NPM1 mutation status. So heterozygous is in red and wild type is in gray. And um, just by way of background, NPM1 mutated leukemias are mostly CD34 negative. Most of the leukemia cells are 34 negative. They have high CD33 expression. And work from uh, Brunangelo Fellini and uh, Paresh Fias has previously shown that the leukemia stem cells that sustain these leukemias may be CD34 positive or 34 negative. And when you see 34 positive cells in these patients, sometimes they are part of the leukemic clone, sometimes they are simply residual normal. Uh, hematopoiesis. And so what we can see here um, is uh, two clusters that clearly look like leukemia cells. They have high levels of CKIT or CD117, that's that red stripe on the left. And that patch of red on the right um, in the two clusters really encompasses many things that are highly expressed in leukemic blasts classically, HLA-DR, CD33, CD44, CD123. But you can see um, this stripe of red kind of in, just to the right of center in the, that marks the top cluster but isn't in the bottom cluster, and that's CD34. So we can see that there's a distinct 34 positive and 38 or 34 positive and negative cluster within the leukemia blasts. And as, if you look over to the right for the presence of the NPM1 mutation, they nearly all have the NPM1 mutation. So. Uh, so this tells us that in this leukemia, the 34 positive cells that we see are really leukemia stem cells that have the NPM1 mutation. Now, if we look all the way to the top to um, the cells that look mostly wild type as shown on the right with the gray stripe up above NPM1, these are largely T cells. So that patch of red on the right is uh, uh, are, are mostly T cell markers such as CD3, CD2, 5, and 7. Uh, the lower two clusters within that are CD4 positive T cells. The top cluster are CD8 positive C T cells based on that uh, stripe of red on more on the left. Um, and so it's not perhaps surprising that the T cells are uh, the, the uh, wild type cells are mostly T cells that's been described in earlier uh, iterations of this technology. However, what's perhaps most interesting is that there are several cells, um, several T cells that clearly have the NPM1 mutation. And so this is completely unexpected as NPM1 is really a mutation. We tend to 
uh, think is only present in really fully transformed leukemia, um, it's previously been shown that there may be a very small fraction of AMLs where you can find at a low variant allele frequency some NPM1 mutations in purified HSCs, but no one has ever been able to demonstrate that you can take an NPM1 mutated HSC and that it, it, it is capable of multilineage reconstitution in a xenograft, which is, has really been our goal gold standard for looking for pre-leukemic stem cells uh, to this date. But this technology really allows us to really look at things in C2, and it's really hard to argue with the fact that NPM1 appears to clearly be present in a very small fraction of the T cells. So this raises a possibility that NPM1 may arise either in a multipotent progenitor or a hematopoietic stem cell, perhaps with li limited self renewal advantage and something that um, without using the single cell technique would have been impossible to really identify um, uh, uh, previously. Now, if we look at more mature cell populations, um, as I've listed uh, here, such as myeloid precursors, different dendritic cell subtypes, eosinophils, and mature monocytes and neutrophils, we actually see that NPM1 is present in the bulk of all of these populations and not just in the leukemic clone. And so this raises a possibility, again, that NPM1 may be present in really a pre-leukemic progenitor or stem cell that may have a strong myeloid bias um, but may still be able to give rise to a few T cells. Um, an alternative possibility is that NPM1 mutant leukemias may actually retain some differentiation potential. And by looking at the clonal relationships between these more mature cells and our leukemic clone, layering on other mutations we know are present in this leukemia and other passenger mutations, um, uh, we're hoping to really uh, get down to the bottom of which of these possibilities are more likely to be true. Um, so with that, I'd like to um, thank uh, all of the members of my lab and uh, the Tissue Bank at uh, UT Seth Western um, for, um, for helping us accomplish these studies, as well as our collaborators, both in the clinic and the lab that have helped us um, take care of these patients, obtain these specimens, and, uh, and get this, the sequencing done. So with that, I'll stop for questions. All right, thank you very much, Sien. Wonderful presentation. As a quick reminder, if you have a question, please type it into the Q&A box. And also, we would like to ask you now to take a brief moment after the webinar has ended to uh, take our exit survey and provide us with your feedback. So let's see what we have for questions. Yeah, there's one question that I think refers to one of the examples you showed, the one of the 82-year-old. And mm -hmm. the question is, at what clinical stage might we expect to pick up wild type, no, sorry, WT1 mutations? And would a 10,000 cell throughput be enough to detect the mutation early enough to make a difference for patients? Mm, sure. Um, that, that's a, a great question. Um, WT1, um, I, uh, I don't believe has really been described to be a pre-leukemic uh, mutation. Um, uh, so mm -hmm. I think it, it, it's something acquired a little later on. That being said, it may still represent a very rare subclone within the leukemia. And so, so I think that's really uh, a very important question in terms of sensitivity of this technique. Um, uh, I think um, our, our colleagues who take care of CML perhaps are uh, uh, ahead of where we are in AML in terms of being able to show in CML that you can have these uh, TKI resistant clones that are at tiny, tiny levels that are even detectable, perhaps at diagnosis that subsequently come out under the selective pressure of a TKI. Uh, but I think that's, that's where as the technology matures, you know, instead of looking at 10,000 cells, can we look at 100,000 or 200,000? Um, our tack on that as stem cell biologists, um, especially in the context of MDS as well, maybe if you pre-enrich the cells you're looking for, such as only looking at, say, if those mutations in MDS stem cells are enriched in the HSC compartment is pre-enriching and sequencing those populations. Okay, thanks. Um, question that just came in. Have you investigated the localization of various mutant clones in matched bone marrow biopsies? Mm. Um, 
Yeah, that's a, a great question. We have not tried that at all, but I think that will be uh, really interesting. As you may have noticed, one of the markers we've looked at is CXCR4, and so, uh, but a lot of uh, our candidate markers do have to do with um, uh, either either cellular adhesion or they may be receptors for certain growth factors, and um, so th those may absolutely. I think it'll depend on the, the cell surface marker, though. Mm -hmm. Okay. And uh, can you elaborate a little on the practical clinical applications of the clonal HSC specific cell surface markers that you have identified? Mm -hmm. Sure. Um, I think practically speaking, um, what it may help with if uh, we can show that they truly are specific for clonal versus non-clonal and robust in terms of uh, sensitivity specificity is that they may uh, make things much more tractable to um, uh, to detect and follow these clones over time, um, both in terms of turnaround. Flow cytometry is something we, we can usually get back, you know, the same day even, or if not in a day. And uh, overall, it, the costs would scale to be much cheaper than next generation sequencing. Um, uh, but I, I do think there is, um, uh, we, we would want to be quite careful in uh, over applying this technology. So clonal hematopoiesis, if you look for um, uh, very low levels, maybe uh, as many groups have shown, maybe uh, nearly ubiquitous. And so we don't want to over diagnose the presence of these clones beyond what might be clinically relevant. Okay. Let's see. Um, yeah, it's a question. Why are there no HSCs with only one mutation in this uh, in the M MDS HSCs that you studied for both DNA and for surface proteins? And would you expect there to be clonal HSCs that are not yet transformed? Sure. So, um. So, going back to um, kind of that that figure, um, uh, it is uh, something that um, one might or might not uh, expect to see. Um, so, in this case, we we um, see many HSCs uh, that have at least two mutations, if not three, and then all wild type HSCs. Um, one might imagine that you would find HSCs that say only have one of the mutations as a pre-existing clonal hematopoiesis. And when we look at the bulk of bone marrow here, um, we do see um, a small subpopulation of cells in the middle that only have the EZH2 mutation. So, um, so we think when we really winnow things down to a smaller number of cells, we may simply not be looking at enough cells. So that, that HSC may exist but it may be so rare because it's been outcompeted by all of these other HSCs. And so what we're working to do is basically to concentrate um, the cells that we sequence um, as much as we can to focus on looking at just as HSCs. So instead of looking at 400 HSCs, looking at you know a couple thousand or, or more. OK, thanks. Um, all right. There's a, let's take this one. There's a question relating to clonal hematopoiesis. Um, and that is, do you believe that older blood or HSC donors should be screened for clonal hematopoiesis um, as an acceptance criterion, uh, given that there's risk of donor-derived hemalignancy? Sure. Um, so it's uh, so that's an excellent and very salient question. Um, uh, there's an, in fact, I think in the uh, the um, issue of blood advances um, uh, for the Ash meeting that's currently ongoing. I think there is mm -hmm. a point and counterpoint really discussing that that exact question. Um, so it remains controversial, but I think there are many issues, and I'll just very briefly touch on uh, kind of the more important points. And one is that I think the technical definitions of CHIP um, have not been really well established, um, say, from institution to institution. How you detect CHIP will vary based on uh, the depth of your sequencing, how many genes you look at, um, and um, and so there isn't a standardized way to look for it. Um, that being said, in the existing studies looking for CHIP in the setting of bone marrow transplant donors, um, the uh, 
the, there's one large published study that suggests that there is no difference in overall outcomes. There may be increased chronic grafters host disease and decreased relapse, interestingly. Um, uh, but there are some other abstracts that have been presented that have um, uh, reported out some conflicting results. So, so um, in large part, we don't uh, definitively know what the influence of having CHIP in uh, donors for bone marrow transplants um, will be. Um, mm -hmm. uh, there is this uh, worry that um, uh, in about 5% of transplants, you can actually develop a donor-derived leukemia. And it has mm -hmm. been shown in some case reports that those donor-derived leukemias can then be traced back to an antecedent CHIP. But having mm -hmm. CHIP in your donor, what is the kind of absolute risk that that represents for developing donor-derived leukemia, that risk is probably still exceedingly low. So, mm -hmm. um, okay. so, so, um, so anyway, so that, that would be kind of the short answer to that. But it's, uh, so, so personally, I would say um, no for right now, um, mm -hmm. but, um, but in the future, that answer may change. Okay, sounds good. Um, looks like this is all the time we have for questions.